All right. Thank you so much. Welcome to another episode of the Love Hope Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond. Of course, I'm the author of Love Hope Lime, what family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. Dr. Mueller, again, we're talking to Dr. Diane Mueller today. She's uh, my Lyme doc. She's the author of It's Not In Your Mind. So I'm excited to talk to another author. We're going to get into some topics today, uh, brain fog, stress, mold, things that uh, I cover in the book. And uh, we really haven't covered in much detail on the Love Hope Online podcast. So I'm really excited today. My book is available on Amazon. Um, Dr. Diane, I've given away over 1,500 free PDF copies of the book. The PDF is always free for chronic Lyme survivors. You can reach out to me on uh Facebook or LinkedIn or any other social media. And I'd be happy to send you a, uh, or YouTube for that matter as well. And I'd be happy to send you your PDF for free. If you want a signed copy of the book, reach out to me via Facebook. I'd be happy to do that. I've done that a ton of times too, Dr. Muir. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to you today. In my book, I, I cover neuro Lyme, the impact of Lyme on the brain, but I know you read the book. I don't go into extreme detail. And the reason that I didn't is because it affects people in so many challenging ways. And uh, again, the book was originally written for, for family members, partners, and friends who have a chronic Lyme survivor in their life to help them understand. And as you and I were talking about before, uh, a lot of the readers have become uh, chronic Lyme survivors themselves who are looking for ways to get support and to explain to people what they really need. But it was a difficult topic to cover in the book because again, it goes, it can really change people. You know, the neuro side of Lyme can be very, very impactful. So I'm glad to have you on the show. Uh, why don't you give us a brief introduction and I want to get re right into this. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to. And, you know, I think it's such important stuff you're talking about here. Like one of the things I really feel like with what I've seen is that Lyme disease does not impact the individual. It obviously does, but it, I shouldn't say, I should say it does not only impact the individual it impacts the family. It impacts the friends and the social circles and, you know, I'll give you my brief introduction, like you said, which is that my history was also with Lyme disease, like so many of us that get into this profession. So I had crazy, crazy, crazy pain so bad that I would sometimes feel like my leg was being sawed off. It was more my left mm. leg than my right leg, but both would be impacted. And this pain sometimes would allow me if I was sitting, I wouldn't be able to move. So like embarrassing stuff, like sitting on a toilet and getting stuck and like having to have somebody like carry me off a toilet in my twenties because I was stuck because the pain was just so bad. It would like literally incapacitate me at times and memory loss, forgetting where I lived, like really, really scary things like that. So now I'm totally in remission. I snowboard, I run, I hike, I feel amazing, you know, other than the occasional common cold kind of scenario. And it's really been amazing to see how much life can, you know, turn around in some of these cases. But it's part of what really like, you know, like you with your own journey, you know, with your family around like being passionate about this, it's really a huge part of like drives like the, the passion around education and talking to people like yourself, because, we just need more information out there. And so many people are so stuck for so long and, and there is hope and, and there are ways that we can work with us. So I want to talk about a couple of specific topics as it relates yes. to what you've, what you cover. Uh, let's first talk about brain fog and stress. So why, why is brain fog and stress? And we can talk about those individually. Let's start let's talk with brain fog. Why is brain fog something that happens with Lyme survivors. And uh, let's define brain fog, then let's talk about stress, and then let's give a couple of solutions for each. Sure, so brain fog is a tricky thing to define from a, to define from a medical perspective, because there's not like a medical diagnosis of brain fog, right? The closest thing we have is mild cognitive impairment, which is like, oh, we're not, we don't have dementia, but the brain is not working as well as it could be. And the scary thing about this, is from a medical perspective, if somebody is having the closest diagnosis to brain fog, which would be mild cognitive impairment, and they get that diagnosis, basically what is based, told to them is to watch and wait because there's not a actual treatment from a conventional standpoint for mild cognitive impairment. We have to wait till dementia sets in 
in order for any of the drugs to actually alleviate symptoms or anything like that. So that sounds scary. And like you, I always like to leave people with hope, which is that from a standpoint of what it actually is and how we define it, the the way we actually really work with this is to figure out the roots and to get to the roots long before we actually even get to a point of it becoming dementia and needing medication. So that's one of the things that we want to do. And then of course, some of the reasons for that can be these things like like the, the actual spirochetes entering the brain, which we do see most commonly at autopsy is typically when that is found is there's actually these spirochetes in the brain. Other reasons for this is we can actually see toxins and these can be mold toxins, toxic metals. They can be biotoxins from Lyme. We actually see there's one study that is showing that the plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's actually have this immune function where we're act they're actually being used as the thought and the analysis from the study is the plaques are being created as a way of trapping infections and toxins. Of course, and it backfires and people get Alzheimer's in these scenarios, but that's showing some of what's happening. They're also contributing to that inflammatory process in the brain because part of brain fog really truly is this the brain being inflamed. And then another thing that I think we have to mention is kind of the mechanism here is we actually see oftentimes, especially in the early onset standpoint of Lyme, we see cortisol, that stress hormone rise, because let's, you know, let's face it, Lyme is real stressful. Later on, cortisol typically falls for most people, but when that cortisol rises, that actually can really negatively impact the hippocampus, the memory center of our brain. And so that can be contributed to the brain fog also that is related to like, what did I come into the room for? Where did I park my car? Those kind of symptoms. So, wow. So I want to go back on a couple of things you said. Uh, you mentioned that the spirochetes actually do get into the brain. So the Lyme bacteria, and also does that include parasites that may come from the various co-infections like Bartonella, for example, does that, do they also get into the brain as well to cause the various types of brain fog? We definitely think so in like in the community. I mean, for sure, I haven't seen a specific study saying like Babesia, but for sure Toxoplasma, right? That one we know for sure gets into the brain. And toxoplasma is so common. It's another one that's not often talked enough about as far as another common co-infection, which is it's so common that it's estimated that 80% of 80-year-olds have this particular infection and it can get into the brain and many times does. And it's it's so it's it's 80% of 80-year-olds because of how much we are exposed to this. And then you put somebody that's Lyme, you know, that has Lyme where their immune system is really dysregulated, right? And then they get exposed to this and the likelihood that this parasite is traveling further and has more impact is high because the immune system is dysregulated. Our white blood sound free cell count frequently goes really low and we don't have the ability to fight these other things like toxoplasma that we encounter. So I'm, I'm hoping you'll be able to answer this question. We talked about, you used the word remission before when talking about your journey. And most people listening to the show or a chronic Lyme survivor, they want to get into the state of remission where they can leave a, live a pain-free, stress-free life for, you know, hopefully decades, right? Um, so what is that? So is the parasite and, and the bacteria, are they just kind of hiding out in the brain and then something happens to, um, to inflame them? That's so it's an area where for sure we got to have a lot more research, right? I do think there's just not at the level of funding that is going into Lyme research that is needed. But what we do know is that Lyme does have these persistent dormant cells, right? There are these persistent dormant forms, I should say. And these persistent dormant forms, basically, I, the way I describe them is almost like, look at it like you have chicken pox, like for those of us that are old enough to have gone through chicken pox. And then, you know, it's like, it's still in their neurological system, right? There's still remnants of this viral, you know, this viral virus there, but the immune system, we just coexist with it. It's like not an issue. We don't walk around feeling like we have any chicken pox symptoms. And then stress is that thing with chicken pox that causes chicken pox and that virus to come out of dormancy. And then all of a sudden somebody has shingles, right? So with Lyme, with like where we're at with the current, you know, studies of Lyme, that's what it looks like is that it's almost like a chicken pox where it's in remission. We have these dormant persister cells that are laying just kind of below the surface with wherever they are hiding, you know, likely in our nerves and joint spaces, since those are two common areas that- mm -hmm 
you know, we tend to see Lyme. And then all of a sudden, as long as, well, as long as we're not getting stress, overly stressed, they stay in remission. And like, you know, it's like in your book, you mentioned that, you know, six step process of recovering from Lyme and gratitude is, you know, that final step, which one of the things that you mentioned that I really appreciate was like, oh gosh, it's really hard to even imagine getting to gratitude. But when you get there, one of the things that we can find, like one of the things I found is, oh, because of Lyme, because of my history of Lyme, because of knowing that stress is the number one thing that will actually cause it to come out of remission, I am highly motivated now on a day-to-day basis to make sure I'm doing all my self-care, to make sure I'm working on my stress, to make sure I'm doing my visualizations and all these things that frankly are helping me prevent heart disease, that are helping me with aging, that are helping me as I'm perimenopause, go through menopause better, all these different things, right? And so the motivation, that's like for me, one of the gratitude things is the motivation to making sure I'm doing these things that I should be doing anyways, really gets heightened because I have that extra thing around like, oh, it's not just about anti-aging. It's not just about menopause. It's about I don't want to do that Lyme thing ever again. So that's one of the things that, you know, ways we can use the gratitude that you mentioned in your book. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's a, that's an amazing answer. Yeah. The chapter in my book was submitted by a guy named Greg Kirk, who does a lot. He wrote a book called the gratitude curve, gratitude curve. And uh, it's a, it's an amazing six step process. And you're right. You, you, everyone goes through them and you may go through them a couple of times, unfortunately, but uh, I'm glad you called that out. I want to get deep into stress. I don't want to get deep into stress. I want to talk about stress. You know, it's, it, I want to get from your perspective, you know, kind of the clinical definition. Um, and you're right. You know, there's been a, a huge spike we've seen in, or I've seen in people who've either come out of remission, we've had flares, you know, during the last couple of years, you know, obviously all the stress caused of the pandemic, and I'm not going to discuss certain aspects of it, but let, let's talk about, first of all, definition of stress. Uh, is it, the number one thing to get rid of. Um, you mentioned before that it does lead to cognitive imbalance. Um, and you also talk in some of your materials about how stress can even cause the brain to change. And again, I'm throwing a lot of things at you, but I know you're the expert on this. So let's get started. Define stress. Why is it so critical to keep yourself away from stress to be able to, to recover from Lyme disease? Yeah, thank you. I think one of the first things I want to make sure we're starting with is with the definition of stress is like, there's that bad stress and good stress and good stress oftentimes is called use stress. Good stress, like an example of good stress is exercise, which is technically a stress on the body, but then the body recovers and is stronger. So I want to be very um, cautious in how we're defining this to say what we're really looking to do from a stress standpoint is keep ourselves regulated from those longer term stressors, right? Because what happens with stress when it's bad is not not the stress itself. Like, Like in a normal healthy stress response, okay, we go into work, we have a stressful day at work, um, we get a rise of cortisol, we come home, our cortisol lowers and, you know, maybe we have a you know, few stressful days, but we're, we're fairly regulated. That does not tend to be problematic when it comes to long-term pathology, long-term problems, long-term Lyme disease, right? The stress that I'm talking about is when the brain starts to get really dysregulated because we've been under stress for so long and we're not adapting to it. And when that happens, the brain all of a sudden loses its capacity to properly actually see how much cortisol our stress, which is our stress hormone is in the blood. So when our brain loses our ability to see that, then one of two things happens. It's either thinking that cortisol is too low and it's kicking out so much of this cortisol, or it's thinking our cortisol is too high and it's not. And then our cortisol crashes. And either one of those things are problems, like too much of that cortisol. And that's where we get the brain fog and the memory changes and all those things too low. And cortisol in proper amounts is an anti-inflammatory agent. So when cortisol goes too low, then all of a sudden we lose its anti-inflammatory properties that often, you know, times causes a lot of problems and low cortisol also leads to fatigue. So it's really about how are we working with stress and how are we working with our stress response? So our brain is continually able to keep everything kind of regulated with our stress hormones, similar to how we want to have a regulated blood sugar, right? Too high is problematic, too low is problematic with cortisol. Same thing. It's like that right amount. 
And so what we see also is dysregulated cortisol actually can contribute to immune dysfunction, right? And so that's the huge relationship we see. One of the big relationships we see with stress and Lyme is we see this imbalance because of this dysfunction, the way I'm describing it. And then all of a sudden our immune system is not working properly. The signals are not getting sent out. And that's you know where we get that resurgence of, of Lyme disease in this example. So in working with it, it's more around techniques around like, okay, none of us humans get to avoid stress. There are external things we can do, right? If we live three hours away from our office or something like that, and we're driving, like maybe we can see if we can work from home or maybe we can look for a new job. So there's, you know, there's external things that we can do sometimes to change stress and reduce stress, but no human, none of us get out of, unfortunately, or, you know, out of stress sometimes in our lives. So then it becomes, okay, how do we actually work with this stress? So it doesn't become this dysfunctional brain pattern. Wow. So you are absolutely right. There's no way if you're a living human being on the planet to remove any type of stress. If you're a parent, if you're a child, if you're in a relationship, you know, one of the most common ways of dealing with stress, of course, is, is fight, flight, or um, fight, flight, or freeze, right? So what is your advice? I mean, have you met any Lyme survivors who have uh, in all three of those stages, you know, who have fled, you know, to avoid, you know, being in stressful situations, you know, what, what are some of your advice on, on all three of those trauma responses to stress? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really good question. I've definitely met people in really every scenario, you know, my, myself with my whole, my whole process, I was right on the borderline of, um, you know, of like fleeing. I was uh, thinking about moving to deserted Island and just being mm. like, where can I just live my life out in a hut? Because I'm definitely dying. And that sounds like the best way to go out. So it's very, you know, it's like I felt that in myself. I've seen that from other people, whether it's like I can't work or I have to um, leave my partner or I can't be, you know, a good parent. And like, I'm just going to basically, and, and this can be sometimes fl uh, flight or freeze of like, okay, I'm not going to come out of my bedroom ever, right? That can be a frozen response. There can be a fear base, like fleeing from the rest of my life, depending upon the brain orientation. So when we're talking about this, like the first thing I always want to make sure to say is like these types of flight, fright, of fight, flight, freeze, these are normal responses, right? This is like, this is like what happens when the body goes into a stressful scenario. So I like to make sure that people realize like this isn't to, you know, to like judge anybody. This is to say your body is actually doing a very normal thing that it's supposed to be doing when a stressor occurs. This is a normal stress type of response. So common, yes. Normal, yes. All of that, absolutely. The problem, the number one problem I see with this is like these types of scenarios are typically run by, by hormones like adrenaline, right? This huge stress, you know, survivor type of hormone, which is good because you are in survivor mode. Problem is when we are in these like types of stressful situations and we're pumping out all these hormones related to that, those are not the hormones that say, hey, body, go repair from chronic disease. Hey, body, be, you know, take down your inflammation level. So the problem we get into is while there's no judgment here, while it's natural, normal, your body is responding like totally from a mechanism standpoint, what is supposed to happen the vicious cycle we really get into this in this is when we secrete those, we feel those things, we secrete all that adrenaline, then we're sending signals to our body to say, break down tissue, not heal, not repair. And then when we do that, then the Lyme and the, the infections and the symptoms can get worse. And then we just get stuck in this vicious chicken and the egg where like the adrenaline in the mind is worsening the symptoms and the symptoms are worsening the adrenaline in the mind. And it's this nightmare chicken and the egg that people are like, well, you know, how do I get out of it? That is such a powerful answer. Again, we're talking today with, with Dr. Diane, Dr. Diane Mueller, my Lyme doc. She's the author of It's Not in My Mind. And um, let's talk about some ways to solve. I mean, one of the one of the promises I make to people is the Love Hope Lyme podcast and my book, it's not a treatment book. You know, as you know, having been a Lyme survivor and now a Lyme doctor, it's it's so um each person's path to recovery or wherever that might look like is unique. You know, there's so many different factors, you know, um, there's not one pill as we know, which is why it makes it so complicated here. 
Um, and I don't like to go deep into treatments because again, I'm not a doctor. As you know, in my book, I had a very, very clear, you know, uh, what's it called disclaimer, but um, I know you talk a lot about supplements and we're going to do a couple shows on the value of supplements. And as you know, many people listening, take them. Is there one or two, and I don't want to give a disservice here by listing one that you have to take and tell people it's going to be, you know, the panacea or the silver bullet, so to speak. But I know you do cover this. Are there any particular supplements that you have found to be particularly helpful in dealing with things like uh, brain fog specifically? Yeah, when we're talking about brain fog, I mean, there's a few different ways to make sure that we are looking at this, right? So it's like always making sure we're getting to the root, which is many more than one or two things. But then also when we're getting to the root of, of Lyme, co-infections, mold, et cetera, then there's also that whole thing around, okay, well, what can we do to help symptoms and lower symptoms enough so that we can actually tolerate a Herxheimer reaction and get to the root and those sorts of things. So from brain fog, phosphatidylcholine, which are a lot of people I know are on, can work really, really well. It can also, for some people, actually slow down MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome. So in other people, of course, with MCAS, it does the opposite. So with MCAS, we have to be very cautious. But um, phosphatidylcholine does work very, very well. There's a particular type of choline called alpha-GPC. C that has been particularly studied for brain health. So that one can work well. That combined with the herb ginkgo biloba works well. And I'm seeing so many results with KPV, with the peptide KPV right now. Some of that is, it's actually, I'm seeing for people with MCAS, it's, I'm actually seeing it lower their MCAS response. So mm -hmm. then we can get some of these other things in, but I am seeing like clarity come out of, of KPV peptide use as well. And then the other thing that I'm very, very new to exploring with my clients um, is low dose ketamine. Mm -hmm. And I'm very excited about that. And one of the things that we're actually seeing with low dose ketamine is like, it's actually like the hippocampus, which is oftentimes destroyed with cortisol and the stress hormones, not destroyed, but d damaged and dysregulated that we're actually seeing that the, the nerves of the hippocampus are actually re repairing. So we're actually seeing memory come back online, clarity, concentration. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty excited. Like it's very, you know, I'm talking about this still like very early in, you know, what I've seen in my clinical patients with Lyme, but I am pretty excited with what I'm seeing so far because I am in these sorts of cases, I am seeing neuro a lot of neurological sy symptoms reset, which is pretty exciting. That is great. That would be fantastic. Um, I want to go back to something you mentioned a couple of times. You talked about getting to the root yeah. and, you know, a lot of times on the, in, in my book, for example, and on the podcast, you know, we talk about the difference between having Lyme disease and tick-borne illness and, you know, like a broken ankle, you know, there's very simple. When you have a broken ankle, the root's pretty simple. You broke your ankle, right? So, you know, there's no mystery to it, but with Lyme, you know, it's, it could be so many different things. And one of the challenges too, as you know, is that sometimes people aren't diagnosed for, for years, if not decades, you know, in some cases, two or three decades, I've spoken to people who said it took them 20, 30 years for finally someone to say, you truly have Lyme disease. And it came because of, because of a, of a tick, but if you will, can you spend a second or two, just kind of talking about that concept for people listening, the whole concept of getting to the root, what does that mean? Uh, we don't need to go excruciatingly detailed about this, but talk about why it's important for people who, who may not have thought about or understand that. Yeah. And I appreciate the broken ankle analogy because I think it's really perfect because with acute medicine, you know, it's like we, we get so used to one root cause. So like you said, it's like you break your ankle. Well, the problem is you tripped over that tree and that's how you mm -hmm. broke it, right? That's the root. Or you go in and you have strep throat. The problem is you got a streptococcus infection and that, you know, cause that lodge in your throat and cause local inflammation and symptoms there. So we're so used to, because most of us throughout our life just have these acute conditions that trains the brain to say, oh, there's one root cause. And so, and that's why oftentimes people with Lyme, especially when they get their Lyme diagnosis, there's two things that happen with that. One, sometimes a level of fear, but oftentimes a level often of relief, at least for like, okay, well, I'm not crazy. There's a reason for that. So that's good, right? We can, you know, it's nice to have a diagnosis to say there's a reason, but oftentimes, and I think this is because of so many of, so much of the training around acute medicine is that then we think like, oh, I found the answer 
with the being emphasized. And so one of the things I'll see frequently is people will jump to different docs, to different docs, to different docs. They'll go to Mexico, they'll go to Europe, they'll like try all these, you know, all these treatments. And it's like, you know, SOT treatment is the newest thing everybody's trying. And I'm not saying there's not reason to do this, right? There's there's a lot of different therapies and we do want to find therapies that work for the individual. And most of the time when I've seen people come and they've seen dozens of different doctors and it's like, this is not working and that's not working and that worked, but it came back and, and all these different things is because of one fundamental thing, which is that Lyme disease is actually only one of the root causes. And there's so many other things that are actually contributing to the symptom picture beyond Lyme. Like, yes, we want to address Lyme, but we can get really lost with the root, I think, because of this acute picture and say, oh, this is only Lyme when it's actually a ton of other things. And, and a lot of times people are thinking like, okay, well, sure, I know about Bartonella or sure, I know about Babesia, but I'm even talking about roots beyond the, you know, the, the Lyme and the, the co-infection situation. Yeah. It, it's such a complex, it's, it's such a, uh, I hate to say this, but as I tell people now, when people ask me about Lyme, I say it's, it's a ridiculous disease that no human being should have to endure. So that's a, it shows you your answer is a great example of why it's so complicated. Um, before I ask you for your final recommendation for chronic Lyme survivors who are looking for support or people in their lives who want to support them better, I want to touch on mold for a little bit. And again, we, we, we're doing a show in the near future just on mold, but I know you cover this and give us some of your thoughts on uh, the impact of mold and what some of your recommendations might be. Yeah. In my book, It's Not In Your Mind, I talk about both Lyme and mold together. And I talk about them because most of the time I find them together. And oftentimes when people are in situations like I'm talking about doc to doc to doc to doc, treatment to treatment to treatment to treatment, and they're like, yeah, it's not really working mm -hmm. most of the time. It's when they also have mold and mold and Lyme. The problems is they're both great mimickers, right? So it's like they both impact the neurological system. They both causes widespread inflammation. So if you look at the symptom lists for Lyme disease and you look at the symptom lists for mold illness, they're commonly very identical. So it's so easy to be like, oh yeah, Lyme explains everything. So I got to the root and it's like, well, but mold also explains everything. And so one of the things with mold that can happen, so mold, Classically, mold illness classically can happen one of two ways. Either we breathe the spores inside of us and we kind of become this like spore infested scenario. More commonly is where we're actually living or working in a place that has the mold spores and it's the toxins. We're breathing in the toxins and the toxins can make them sick. The third scenario is actually a combination of the two. We're like living or working in it. We breathe in the toxins and the spores and then we have the toxins, but we're also say self-producing the toxins because the spores are living inside of us. But regardless of this, we have the resultant thing is our immune system does not, you know, it's, it's say busy, it's diverted, it's working to fix this whole other problem. And that's another thing, just like with stress, where it's like, okay, do we have this immune dysregulation because of the mold? And what can sometimes happen for people is that exposure to mold is actually that triggering of that reoccurrence of Lyme that maybe even the first time they had Lyme was just like a flu. They didn't get the, the target lesion rash and it just felt like a flu. They didn't even know it was Lyme and went into remission. And then all of a sudden they move into a moldy place. They get chronic Lyme symptoms. It gets diagnosed as Lyme and they don't actually realize that their home is, you know, causing it. And that's like tie its first full circle to your fight, flight, freeze question. This is an area where so, you know, this conversation is where I see so many people go into freeze mode because the thought of when you feel this bad of your house being the thing that's making you sick and the thought of moving and testing and remediation or all those different things that go with this sometimes can really cause this free state, which is completely understandable and again, completely normal. But at some point in order to get well, it becomes important to face the fact that, you know, this is the case that the house could be the thing that is actually keeping you sick. As hard and as crappy as that is, sometimes it's the only way out.
That's a great, that's a great answer for that. And I've uh, often wonder why people struggle with that so much. And that's, that's a beautiful way of saying it. it. It's a challenge. It's a difficult way to grasp, but I really appreciate you saying that. Um, again, we did today's interview in March of 2024, and uh, I know you have the next version of the book. It's not in your mind. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and tell us the best way for people to find some of your resources. Yeah, thank you. And and like your your own book, my book is really a book of taking people to fairly, it's like I go into some of the mechanisms in there as far as how people get sick. But my goal was to make this very, very readable for, you know, for public people is written for people that are survivors that are trying to figure out how to get out of these situations. Even, you know, I, I take it down into like, okay, if you're interviewing a doc, there's a chapter on there, like, what questions should you be asking your doctor to know if this doctor is right for you, right? So I really make it practical for people. That's kind of the, the goal with it. Um, we go step by step into my methodology as far as what order I see to work the best most of the time. Everybody is unique, of course, but how to really think about that, what things you might be missing, what tests you might be missing, treatments for both Lyme and mold and co-infections and more. So this summer, so basically summer of 2024 is essentially when we are doing a huge promotional re-release of this. I'm working on the audible version. So there be the vocal version if you prefer to listen and not read. So definitely look out for that because that's, um, if you're listening to this, when this is released, this podcast is released, at least that's coming down the pipeline really soon. All right. Once again, I want to acknowledge you and congratulate you on the great work you've done. The publication, your website has some great videos up on YouTube as well, where you go into some detail on a lot of the things that we talked about in more detail. And, you know, once again, uh, these are topics that uh, I hear time and time again. How do you get past the brain fog? How do you deal with stress? I mean, I, I like your answer just by living as a human being, right? You know, you can't go to a deserted island because you're still going to have the same stressors in your life. It's you know, how do I find food on this deserted island, whatever it might be? So thank you for clarifying a lot of the things that uh, I've been looking for some answers on and for the book and for all the work that you're doing for, for so many people who are, are struggling and, and just looking for answers. Uh, what are your final thoughts for either the chronic Lyme survivors who are looking for support or for the family members, partners, and friends who love someone with chronic Lyme who want to be of better support? Yeah, as far as if you're, you know, if you're looking for support, I really, the biggest thing I would really encourage you to is, like I was kind of hinting at earlier, is don't just get stuck on the Lyme diagnosis only. Like, absolutely work with somebody Lyme literate that can help you. But if that person doesn't know much about mold or parasites or gastrointestinal illnesses or thyroid, adrenal, sex hormone dysfunction that goes with these disease processes, then at least putting together a care team that can fill in some of those gaps for you. It's really, really important. So there are some people like me that just have studied enough to do this all and other people haven't, and that's fine. You just want to make sure you have at least your team together of people that can do all of that. So that's one thing. And then the biggest thing, I think if you are a care provider, I mean, one, you know, people reading your book, Love, Hope, and Lime, I think is huge because it you really do give a lot of practical advice in there. And then secondly, besides that, I would say, you know, just really, truly like, like providing that, that belief and that validation for that person in your life, because so many times I feel like for so many of us that go through this, there's just so much invalidation in every area of life. And so just, you know, really working to provide that validation and, you know, an emotional support can go really, you know, really far and if the relationships allows, then like, you know, providing that, that information on validating, but also not letting people get stuck there. Meaning if somebody is like in this, like fight, you know, fight or flight freeze phase that we're talking about and their adrenaline is high, adrenaline is high, adrenaline is high. The most supportive thing in many ways is to be like, you know, is, is reminding them of things that we talked about today around like, yes, of course you feel this way. This is so normal and validating all their emotions and then reminding them of like, okay, and we have to find a help you find a way of getting, even though your stress is normal and how you're feeling is normal and all of that, we have to find a way of getting you out of that cycle and having a system to get you out of the cycle so that we can actually get you out of the disease process. So, you know, validating, but then also not doing it in a way where we're not, you know, we're allowing them to just live in that state 
Because even though, like I said, it's natural, it's normal, it's warranted, all of those things, living in that stress state is preventing the healing. So it's it's really that both and that that really you know comes together in in helping people. Absolutely. All right. Once again, I want to thank Dr. Diane Mueller for being on today's Love Hope Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond.